If you've ever driven through the Midwest in the summertime, you've probably suffered through the unfortunate situation of having your windshield turn into a Jackson Pollock painting. Uh, what I mean by that is that as you're driving along, you will inevitably just get splattered by bug goo. Uh, it just seems like whenever you drive anywhere in the Midwest, you get bug goo everywhere all over your windshield. Uh, but this leads to an important physics question in my mind. Uh, Suppose you have a car, and then right at the second there's some giant bug that's about to get splattered on your windshield. Which of those two objects, the car or the bug, feels a bigger force? Now, most people will be tempted to say, well, the bug's getting splattered, so clearly it feels a bigger force. So we can write the force of the car on the bug. Uh, but it turns out that the force of the car on the bug is exactly the same as the force of the bug on a car. So if I want to look at the force on the car, I would have exactly the same length like arrow. I'm trying to make those a little bit closer to the same size. The force of the car on the bug is the exact same size as the force of the bug on the car. Now, how can that be? Let's say you want to throw a punch. I'm not trying to promote violence here, but just for practical purposes, uh, educational purposes, let's say you want to throw a punch. So do you want to hold your hand like this, or do you want to hold your hand like this? Now notice the difference, here or here. Now, uh, if you've ever been in a fight, uh, hopefully you haven't, but if you have, you know that you do not want to grip your thumb, because if you grip your thumb, um, at least what people say is that when you punch, you will end up breaking your thumb. The reason for that is pretty simple. Um, if you hit someone, the force is not just felt by the person you hit, it also is felt by your hand. Um, you, you have a large risk of injuring yourself during a punch too if you don't do it correctly. And the reason is, again, force is felt between two things, and it turns out that the two forces are exactly equal. They're just in opposite directions. So if I punch someone, there's the force of the, my hand on their face. The face feels a force this way. It turns out there's an equal and opposite force pushing back from my face on the hand. Now, generally, you don't think about, uh, if somebody gets punched, you don't think, well, their head really hit their, that guy's fist really hard. Uh, but it turns out that's actually what's happening from a physics point of view. So let's go back to our bug example. When the car hits the bug, the bug feels an equal and opposite force to, uh, that the car feels. So there's the force of the car and the bug, and then there's the force of the bug on the car. It turns out physically there's no way to make one of those two bigger. This is what's known as Newton's third law. Uh, it is most commonly referred to as equal and opposite forces. Uh, I think that's a little bit misleading. Uh, I think the better way to say it is that if there is a force from object A on object B, If there is a force from object A on object B, and there is a force, there is an equal and opposite force, equal and opposite force of B on A. That is a physical law. Whenever I have one force, there must be some reaction pair force. Sometimes these are called reaction pairs. Reaction pair forces. There must be some equal and opposite reaction pair force uh, 
from B on A if there's a force of A on B. We can test Newton's third law to a certain degree. So uh, here I have just a force meter. Um, basically just a scale, if I pull down on the spring, I can get that scale to turn around. Uh, but depending on how hard I pull this with, I will get more or less force. I have exactly the same scale here. Again, if I pull down hard, I get more force. Now, what I challenge you to do, if you can find a way around this, I will give you an A in the course and $100,000 and a Nobel Prize, uh, because there is no way, line these guys up a little bit better, there is no way to get these two arrows to give me significantly different forces. The harder I pull, the more force I get, but they're never going to be significantly different. If this number is on the 12, the other one, the top scale is on the 12, the other one also has to be on the 12, because the force that this scale exerts on this scale has got to be equal and opposite. So the fact that they're equal simply means they have to have the same value. It's just that this scale is being pulled down, whereas this scale is being pulled up. So whenever we have two different objects that are exerting forces on each other, what we can do because of Newton's third law, as we can say definitively that there is some force from B on A, B on A, and there is also some force from A on B. Here are my two guys playing tug of war, but this works for any force, any force in the universe. If there is one force, there's got to be a reaction pair force that measures up to it. If there's a force from B on A, there also has to be a force of A on B. Forces always act between objects, so I can't just have a force by itself. It's always got to be from something, and then it's always got to act on some object. The force of A on B has got to be equal to the force of B on A. Now, going back to our uh, mosquito example. Why was it, why do we think that the mosquito feels a bigger force? Well, certainly what's true is that the mosquito is getting splattered. Uh, but why, why does the mosquito have a big splatter but nothing, we don't see that big effect for the car? Well, there's a few things going on there. Thing number one. Cars are a lot harder than mosquitoes are. When I have something made of metal, or glass in the case of the windshield, that's a lot harder than a tiny mosquito is. But the bigger effect, the more important thing, is that my mosquito, my bug that splatters into the windshield, has a much tinier mass. So there's two things we can consider. Which has a bigger force? Newton's third law says they have to have equal and opposite forces between the car and the mosquitoes, so that the force on the car, force of the mosquito on the car, has got to be the same as the force of the car on the mosquito. Those two are equal and opposite. They're the same. What's different? What's actually bigger for the mosquito? Well, it's that the mosquito has a bigger acceleration. So if I go back to Newton's second law, add up the forces on the mosquito, that has to equal its mass times its acceleration. Well, we said the forces are the same, but the mass is much, much smaller for the mosquito, therefore its acceleration has to be huge. The acceleration of the mosquito is huge, that's why we think the force on the mosquito is bigger. The force is the same. The force of the mosquito on the car is exactly the same as the force of the car on the mosquito, but the mosquito accelerates a lot more because it's tinier, so it's easier to push around. I 
I have a riddle for you uh, that involves Newton's third law. So here I have a horse pulling a cart. Gee, here's my horse. Here's my cart. You will note that every horse I draw tends to look like a weird cross between a dinosaur and a duck. Don't worry about that for now. I'm not the best drawer. Uh, we have a horse pulling a cart. Now my riddle for you is this. Newton's third law says that the force on the cart has to be equal and opposite to the force of the cart on the horse. So we have the force of the horse on the cart. Well, the third law says there is, it has to be, it must be the case, that that is equal and opposite to the force of the cart on the horse. So if that is the case, if the two forces are equal and opposite, how is it that the horse can ever start moving? Those two forces cancel out. How can the cart ever start moving if there's always going to be an equal and opposite uh, force on the cart and the horse and the horse and the cart? Okay, we're back. Have you figured it out yet? I can't hear you because that's not how video and internet works. Anyway, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go over. Uh, we have force of the horse on the cart and the force of the cart on the horse. Those forces definitely cancel out. So how can the horse move forward? Well, those aren't the only forces in the system. So you might ask, well, how does anybody move forward? How do I go walking across the room? I have to exert an equal and opposite force on something. What am I pushing back on? The answer is the ground. So when the horse walks, when anybody walks, you take your feet and you push back on the ground. Um, your, the horse's foot, every time it takes a step, you think, well, moving forward, if you actually look at what your leg's doing, it's pushing backward on the ground. So there's another third law pair here. There's the force of the ground on the horse. And since there's the force of the ground on the horse, there must be an equal and opposite force of the horse on the ground. So every time you are pushing on something, every time you take a step, you are pushing back on the ground. You are pushing the earth backward. That is what causes you to accelerate there's always equal and opposite reaction pairs. One thing moves this way, another thing has to get accelerated that way. Equal and opposite reaction pairs, there's no way around that. Newton's third law says that whenever I have a force from A on B, I have to have an equal and opposite force of B on A. Here's my situation. I've got two blocks, one of mass MB, which is two kilograms, another of mass Ma, which is one kilogram. My two blocks, A and B, are getting pushed by a force three, of three newtons that's acting on block B. So I have two questions I want to answer. I want to find the acceleration, and I want to find the two forces. What's the force of block A on B, and what's the force of block B on A? First thing I want to do, let's find the acceleration. To do that, I can use a little bit of a trick. So I know that when B pushes into A, they're just going to get st stuck together and keep moving in one direction. If that's the case, they both have to have the same acceleration because they're moving together. So I can treat them as one big object. I'm going to just treat this as one big object with a force of three newtons pushing to the right. I do my usual steps. I've got my free body diagram. Sum up the forces. In this case, it's just three newtons to the right. That has to equal the mass times the acceleration. I know my mass. In this case, it would be my total mass because it's one big block. The total mass is two kilograms plus one kilogram. So the one, if I treat it as one big block, it's just three kilograms. So that's three kilograms. 
So I can solve for my acceleration. I have 3 newtons equals 3 kilograms times the acceleration. Therefore, the acceleration has to be 1. Divide 3 on both sides. Acceleration has to be 1 meter per second squared. Simple enough. Now I want to go to step two on that problem, which is that we want to find the force of A on B and the force of B on A. So I know both blocks are accelerating at one meter per second squared, because I've treated them as one big block with a force of three newtons. Now I want to treat them as separate blocks. If I want to find the force of A on B and B on A, I've got to treat them as separate entities. So I'm going to have to do different free body diagrams for each. We'll start with block B. We know it's got a 3 newton force on it. I know block A is also, have, also has to have some force, but I'm not sure if it's 3 newtons anymore. But it definitely has some force because there's a force of B pushing on it. Block A is not going to feel the 3 newton force. Because the 3 newton force is pushing on block B, it's not necessarily pushing on block A. But block B is pushing on A, so I have the force of B on A. And I know if there's a force of B on A, there has to be a force of A back on B, and it's got to be exactly the same size. A little bit bigger. There's the force of A on B. So I'm going to sum up forces on each of these two blocks. Let me start with block A. Sum up the forces on block A. Well, it's really just the force of block B on block A. That's easy enough. That has to equal the mass of A times its acceleration. Well, I know the mass of A. I know that's one kilogram. And I know the acceleration of A, which is also the acceleration of B, is one meter per second squared. So the force of block B on block A is just mass A times the acceleration. So the force of block B on A has just got to be one kilogram times meter per second squared, or one newton. Similarly, the force of block A on block B by Newton's third law, the force of A on B is just minus force of B on A. Therefore, the force of A on B has got to be minus 1 meter. I know that it has to be true by Newton's third law. But we should check just to make sure it's consistent. So let's, one, let's say the force is minus 1 newton, but let's check to make sure that if I plug in this force and sum up the forces on B, I still get the right acceleration. So let's try that. Now I want to sum up the forces on block B. B has two forces on it. It's got that three newton force. And it's got the force of A on B. That has to equal the mass of B times its acceleration. Uh, I'm going to, actually, I should be careful here. I need to plug in a plus sign here. Because when we plug in, when we solve for this number, we want to get a negative value. So I want to put a plus here for now. We'll Assume it's positive, we'll show it's negative in just a second. I want to solve for the force of A on B. Let's assume I don't know what, actually let's plug in our negative one newton here. We'll see what we get. So this is going to be three newtons minus one newton equals the mass of B, which I know is two newtons, times the acceleration. We want to see if, uh, sorry, mass is two kilograms. Masses are in kilograms. Uh, so I, let me plug in the, that two kilograms here. We'll see if we get the right acceleration. We'll see if we get an acceleration of one meter per second squared. Three newtons minus one newton is two newtons equals T 
two kilograms times the acceleration. And lo and behold, if I divide both sides by two kilograms, we get two divided by two is one, newtons divided by kilograms is meters per second squared, so I get the correct acceleration, one meter per second squared. So it all works out, everything is consistent, as it has to be. Uh, so Newton's third law says that I have equal and opposite reaction pairs, so that the force of A on B has to be equal and opposite to the force of B on A. Um, 